That's wonderful. Praise the Lord. Okay, so um, we're going to go to the Bible. Um, we're going to go to share with these. Um, I guess Soko, if you don't mind, just turn the, I think the, the, the thing is boiling, just switch the power off. Yeah, that's great, Soko. Thank you very much. Um, right, we're going to start off in, uh, in the book of Mark, chapter 8. Uh, great, great testimonies, and you know, wherever we are, uh, wherever we go, and you know, like last night, we've been hearing, hearing a lot of things, a lot, a lot of testimonies, a lot of wonderful things that the Lord has actually done in our lives and other people's lives across the globe. And uh, it's something that um, it's, it's true, uh, it's real, and obviously, people here among us here today, including the young ones who have been baptized in the spirit field, uh, we've got such a wonderful story. Yeah, that's a beautiful story. To share to uh, to the dark world, and uh, and obviously um, you know, we are surrounded by uh, fear and uh, many things that we can see in the in the, in the modern day time we're living. In. And uh, obviously, the Bible holds the answer to everything in life. Okay, we're going to start off in Mark chapter eight. Uh, the title of this talk is called. Um, I wrote a title here somewhere. Yeah. We're going to look into uh, one scripture here about Jesus, yeah. talking about life and the importance of, uh, of, of uh, to have salvation. And, uh, because that's why he came to the world for uh, to give life and life more abundantly uh, to mankind. And uh, Okay, Mark chapter chapter eight. The title is called "How Safe Is Your Soul?" I think it's a question we can, uh, or perhaps we can, uh, we can present to others, and maybe perhaps we can, uh, we can, we can look into ourselves as well. Uh, how how safe is, is, is my soul? How, how safe is my life? Um, is there any security in this life? Um, in Mark chapter eight, we pick it up in verse. Um, in verse 35, he says, For whosoever shall save his life shall lose it, but whosoever shall lose his life for my sake and the gospel and the, and, and, and the same shall save it. Uh, for what shall it profit a man if he, shall, if, he, if he shall gain the whole world and lose his own soul? Uh, or what shall a man give in exchange for his soul? Um, what is, uh, Jesus was actually presenting here to, uh, uh, to, to people. Uh, he was saying, if you, if you want to, um, you you know, if you want to save your life, this life now, you will end up losing your soul. You know, that's, that's actually the answer of it. And I suppose we're living in a time where, where you know, we, where, where we're trying to save uh, this, this life. We're trying to please uh, this life. And I'm sure uh, you know that we we all want to do that. We all want to achieve something. We all want to we all we all want to uh, aim. We all want to have a blessed life. We all want to have hope, if you like, and and to have the love of God. And uh, uh, but uh, the importance of of, of 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 the soul of the salvation uh, that Jesus is actually talking about here. It's about to get ourselves right with God. You know that's the only way that you can actually achieve. And you can see miracles and wonders and, and healing. And, uh, you know, this, this life, uh, one day you and I will die. This life is, is worth nothing. You know, we all come from the dust of this earth, back in the creation of uh, mankind in, in Genesis. We're all going to turn back to dust. You know, but the soul is what God is dealing with. Uh, you know, it talks about in the book of Psalm, it talks about that every soul belongs to God. You know, that's, that's where all the source of life come from. That is where all is all origi you know, originated from, right back in, you know, in creation. If you go to um, uh, uh, scriptures in Deuteronomy, chapter 28. Chapter 28 um, is actually a, a scripture. Um, uh, it's, um, it's a national law. You know, this, this particular scripture here in, in Deuteronomy, chapter 28, and obviously, we talk about the law uh, that God given to Israel in Exodus chapter 20, but this one is something a little bit more, perhaps a little bit more depth of, of, what, uh, 
of what mankind uh, should uh, should have a choice in life uh, to make a decision of what what they have to do to achieve eternal life, to achieve a great life, to see the goodness of God, to see the greatness of God, to see wonders and healing taking place, to have security, if you like. And uh, here, Deuteronomy chapter 28, and uh, it's pretty much uh, uh, you know, it's pretty much the prophecy of uh, of what the state of the world will you know will become like. You know, we, we just had a testimony of, uh, of of a young girl, a sister, who got healed from anxiety. You know, and uh, you know, in the book of John, it talks about that uh, perfect love casts away fear. The perfect love of Jesus Christ will take away fear, will take away you know uh, um, you know anxieties. A problem, a situation that mankind could actually cope or handle or find a way across to the other side, if you like. You know, we heard this term called there is the light in the end of the tunnel. You know, it's a common term uh, that we can hear from people. But in this particular book, in this fellowship, in Jesus Christ, there is always going to be the light because he was the light of the world. He come to give life and life more abundantly. You know, and, and, and he talks about here in Deuteronomy chapter 28, the state of, uh, of, of people when they perhaps they've lost sight of God. They've lost sight of God. They've lost sight of perhaps, um, you know, creation and, and, you know, how God have actually uh, unfold his, his power, you know, his, his design, because he's the maker. He's the maker of this universe. And, and there's a lot of scriptures that talks about that, you know, that connects to that. But the moment mankind become to lose sight of that, and they start to dwell in their own ideas and philosophies, and they create their own, perhaps their own gods and, and religion and so on and so forth, they've lost sight, they lost the power of God, they lost the blessings of God, and then the curse follow them. The curse of God follow them throughout in history until modern day time, that's why we got people suffering from depression. It's not the fact that God is punishing them. It's either you obey God, you will live forever, or you disobey God, there will be problem. So there is choices. God have actually set a place called a Garden of Eden, isn't he? Back in Genesis, where he placed mankind on it. And God said to him, don't touch that. You know, and the moment they you know they were deceived by you know the prince of this world uh, satan the devil and and that's why the fall of mankind came the fall of mankind is just keeps stacking up through the history of men we had wars we have pestilence and ferments bloodshed over the years because of what mankind have actually done you know and, and the gospel came in jesus christ came in represent life through the death, uh, death, the suffering on the cross, that he take the sin of mankind on that behalf, taking through that to nail it on the cross, there is an opportunity now for anybody or somebody anywhere in the face of this universe, whatever color, whatever state of life, they can partake with the sacrifice of Jesus Christ. That's the only way in. There is no other way in that people can have a victory over situation victory over trial, victory over, you know, the state of life, if you like. You know, uh, and, and he talks about here in Deuteronomy chapter 28, and he talks about here, these people here, they will not actually see the future of their life. They only see what's now. What can I do now? What can I, can I do to, you know, to please myself or to please others? You know, and, 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 uh, and you know, people just sort of lost sight. There is future for everyone. Every people on this planet Earth, there is future for everybody. It's a better future. Jesus Christ already showed us the way of that. And he talks about here in Deuteronomy chapter 28. This is actually, uh, you know, the outcome or the benefit of people disobey God. And God is not going around punishing people and walking around with a big stick and all this. He's a loving God. You know, throughout the scriptures, we have people like Moses and Joshua, people like you and I. You know, they have a willingness to do what is right. In fact, Noah, you know, back in Genesis chapter 6, we see the story of Noah. He talks about that the earth then was filled with violence. People were turned to be very evil. 
people become very fiercest, you know, very, you know, feel hatred and, and anguish and, and wars and fighting, angry and, and all this other stuff. No wonder why people, even now today, they're still angry with God. In Proverbs chapter 19, it talks about it. Proverbs chapter 19, verse 3. People blame God for wrong things happen. People point fingers on God. You know, later on in, uh, you know, in, in, uh, you know, in the book of Ezekiel, it talks about that they've seen God that he's not equal to them. God becomes unequal in their life. And God said, no, I've made you equal. I've made, I, I'm, I'm very fair to you. But you, because of you turn your, way, your back against me, you become unequal. And this is, you know, the, you know, you know, the perhaps I, you know, I suppose it's the balance, isn't it? It is the ba balance where mankind just, they just couldn't see it. They just couldn't see. They just want to pick and choose what they feel like to do. They pick somewhere to feel themselves full comfortable, you know. And, you know, uh, if, if I do this, this is going to be enough, this, you know, this sort of thing. But, but it comes down to this particular book. It's either disobedience or obedience to the Word of God. And the Word of God, uh, you know, the Bible holds the structure of any things that we have in life. Every aspect of it. You cannot get away with it. Everything that you want to know about your life is in this book. It's history. It's historical. And it's, uh, it talks about what's happening now and what's have to come in the future. And it talks about here in verse 66, in 65 rather, and among these nations shall uh, thou find no ease. So this is actually the benefit of turning away from God. You know, he says, uh, Neither shall the sole of thy foot have rest, but the Lord shall give in thee a trembling of heart, a, a failing of eyes, and a sore of mind. Now he's talking about here anxiety. He's talking about depression. He's talking about mental issue, mental brain, and mental breakdown, and all this kind of thing. And... You know, it is true. It's, it's talking about the situation that what has to be fallen. You know, what has to come. Because of the state of the world we listen to the return of Jesus Christ. And he says in And thou life shall hang uh, in doubt before thee, and thou shalt fear day and night, and thou shalt have none assurance of thy life. And in the morning thou shalt say, Would God it were even. And it, even thou shalt say, Would God it were morning. For the fear of thine heart, wherewith thou shalt fear, and for the sight of thine eyes, thou shalt see. I've got a slide here. If you put it up a slide, Carolyn, please. Just a slide of the current day uh, situation, uh, which is great. Um, a lot of people are depressed. Um, you know, it's quite common in the Western society. Um, anxiety. And uh, just sort of connecting to these verses here where God's spoken of what will happen to people if they turn away from God. Um, Oh, sorry, it's the next one, Caroline. It's the very last one on, the, on, on those slides. Sorry, if we go to the next slide. Yeah, next. It's, it's a very bottom one, yeah. Um, that's the one, yeah. We click with a couple of other slides. Right. Okay, depression doubles uh, during a coronavirus pandemic, twice as many adults in Britain. Uh, are reporting symptoms of depression now compared with this last year office of the national statistic figure suggests. So it's, uh, it's something that is, we know that people right here in our fellowship, they have these problems and God healed them. We heard in the testimony, God healed them. So many other testimonies, you know, in, you know, in our fellowship, God healed them. God take away those things and replace something even better something that comes with purpose, something comes with security and future and reality. You know, the life of Jesus Christ is available to anybody. That we can go and preach the gospel. We can tell others there is life. There is an answer to this. You know, in, in our days, the amount of people are suffering and struggling. People are out of work. There's, there's money crisis. There's economy collapse. It's not just, it's just, just a local matter. It's going to be a global matter. It's connected to Revelation. It's the end of the world. It's the time we're living on now. And the Bible talks about it a heck of a lot of prophecy before the return of, uh, of Jesus coming back. No wonder people are, are in fear. Are in fear. People are living in fear. People perhaps have got no understanding what the future holds for them. 
Is this pandemic is going to be finished and what's going to happen after that? Nobody knows what's going to be happening after the upcoming winter because they're talking about since everything's going to lift it up in June and then we're going to go back to normality. But what will happen in winter? Nobody knows. Nobody knows the time of the hours, isn't it? The Bible talks about when the Son of Man comes back. But we, we as mankind, we try to uh, create some form of environment to protect ourselves from death, from fear, from hatred, from all perhaps the things that we see around in our community perhaps. You know, and no wonder why we have authorities who try to control crime. You know, it's, it's now, you know, you, know, you know, like for females, they, you know, they find themselves now that they are, they are almost just, they just couldn't leave their homes to work, you know, to just go across the road in the middle of the night to go and get something from the shop. You know? Things are changing rapidly. They are changing fast. But guess what? There is a way out of that. The only way is to have these and to be healed of all these things that the Bible talks about here, the state of the world, is Jesus Christ. Jesus walks the earth. He preached the gospel. He raised people from the dead, dead from the, you know, um, you know Lazarus, wasn't he? Heal all men of sicknesses. You know? And how much more we need of that? How much more proof that if this is really true, if a miracle that Jesus did 2,000 years ago, can I really know this? Is this something certain? Can I put this to test? Can I test the waters to see if these people, the people of the Bible, are genuine people? If there is a God, can I come and find it out? And we have that, haven't we? We have that in our fellowship. Even people right here, even in fact there was somebody who was actually a, um, I think he was, a, uh, he was an atheist, wasn't he? He travel around the world looking for some form of peace. But obviously he comes to a point that he doesn't believe there is a God anymore. You know, going around and he end up met somebody in Australia and witnessed to him and challenged him. You know, you, can, you, can, you don't have to come to a meeting, but you can call upon God by yourself. Call upon the name of the Lord. He prayed to God whether this person was saying was true, whether the healing that he was testified to him was true. He called upon the name of the Lord. He prayed to God for proof. Bang, he spoke in tongues. You know, there was a brother in, uh, in, in Adelaide. He was an atheist. And this is what we can actually believe, that the God of the Bible is different from the religious God. This is not religion. This is about God, Jesus Christ. I've always said to people, Jesus, you know, Jesus died on the cross, not religion. Religion did he die on the cross for your sin. Jesus did. You know? And uh, we go to 1 Kings chapter 17. Thanks, Carolyn. Uh, 1 King chapter 17, the life of Elijah the prophet. Um, just a couple of story here, just, just to sort of connect it to the, you know, to the story as I'm just reading out now. 1 King chapter 17, Elijah the prophet, he was a prophet of, a, a prophet of Israel. And um, this particular time where these two kingdoms of Judah and Israel, they were not actually going on well together by themselves. We got uh, Jerusalem down south. And they will take control by the Jews. And on the northern part of Israel, we got the ten tribes. And they were taken control also by obviously, you know, obviously their brethren. Uh, they were all the nation of, uh, they were all God's people, and they? And they were not actually getting on well together. Because there's so many stories in the Bible, they've actually also lost sight. But once upon a time, God called them to be a special people. And then as time goes on, they disobey God. Throughout the Bible, there is problems after problems after problems because they put God aside. You know? But the moment they repented, you know, they repent from whatever they've done wrong, uh, wrong God allowed them back. And then they, they do things in the wrong way again. It's just things that we uh, get distracted by in this world, isn't it? There's a lot of things that actually choke, choke us away, take our attention away distract us away. There's so many things that we're surrounded by them in modern day now. And, uh, but, uh, but the Word of God, the moment that we receive the Word of God, we receive the Holy Spirit, you won't be distracted by anything whatsoever. Your focus becomes to be Christ. That's your life. You will understand a clear future of what it's about when you 
you know, when you when you uh, you know when you're walking on in the Lord in this earth. Um, there's P. First King chapter 17, just a couple of verses here. We see here there's a situation that face about this uh, this uh, this widow, uh, this lady, and uh, there was a time of a drought. And it was actually, if you sort of imagine this this particular time is also the time we're living on now, you know, if you like, time of the pandemic. And um, it talks about here, Elijah, the prophet came and uh, uh, he was actually coming in representing God, representing life. The herbs representing, you know, the future of the life of this particular lady and the son. They've got no hope at all. And they have to go to Elijah and listen to what Elijah has to say in terms of, uh, in terms of salvation, if you like, you know. In verse 1, and Elijah the Tishbite, who was of the inhabitants of Gilead, said unto Ahab, Ahab was the king of Israel, as the Lord God of Israel liveth before whom I stand, there shall not be dew nor rain this, uh, these years, but according to my word. And the word of the Lord came unto me, saying, Get thee hence and turn thee eastward and hide thyself by the brook Cherith that is before Jordan. Now, this is actually a well known prophecy that happened. Uh, uh, happened after quite some time and this was actually a drought coming in the land of Israel the reason of a drought because of the disobedience of mankind mankind have turned away from God this is God's people that have turned away from him and Elijah said to look there will be a drought you know there will be a drought now this drought lasts on for about well over three years three three years and six months something around that and you guess what the drought, you know through the beginning of this drought now there is major rivers that runs across the land of Israel. We've got a river called Gishon that runs across, you know, the northern part of Israel in Samaria goes down to the sea of Sidon, modern day Lebanon. And there's also a river that come out from the middle of Israel that leads to the Sea of Galilee. And then we also got Jordan River as well as where John was baptizing people in the time of Jesus Christ. Now we're talking about this is the time of Elijah. Now all these rivers were dried up, were dried up, and brings ferment, brings problem. People have got no idea what to do. And God said to Elijah, I look after you, I look after you, let me see if these people acknowledge me as their savior. He says in the Bible. Now he goes on for three and a half years, and Elijah, right in the middle of the problem of the situation, and guess what? God looked after him. He talks about here that God provided a, a, you know, a raven or a bird, come and feed him and give him food. He was living on this little place. You know, people couldn't actually survive because three major rivers were dried up. They couldn't cultivate or provide any form of crop for their source of life and so on and so forth. And he talks about in verse 12 that he come across this particular lady, this widow, and he said, and she said, the lady said to Elijah and said, and the Lord thy God liveth, I have not a cake, but a handful of meal in my barrel and a little oil in the cruise. And behold, I'm gathering two sticks that I may go in and, 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 and dress it for me and my son, that we may eat it and die. And Elijah said to her, fear not, go do thou so said, but make me the little cake first and bring it unto me and after me. Uh, after make for thee a for, uh, for thy son. Now this this widow and the son and her son, they only have this little amount of food to survive on in the middle of the famine. You know, now today, people are just surviving, aren't they? There are people in Great Britain now, in fact, across the globe, are just surviving. You know, they're talking about cutting all these benefits. They're talking about all these other stuff. The next generation perhaps to come, they are the ones who are going to face the debt. You know? These people were only surviving on this little amount of food. And guess what? Elijah was right in the middle of them to give them the answer to the question. To give them the answer to the question. And they did both receive the answer to the question. They provide, they did exactly what Elijah did. And guess what? It talks about in the next verse, the food keep piling up in their house. The water keep coming in in their house. 
the son and the mother, they were happy. That is just to see the situation of what actually unfolds throughout history when mankind start to turn away from God. Mankind these days, they think they're cleverer than God, aren't they? He talks about in, I think in, uh, in Isaiah chapter 5, he says, Woe unto thee that they call evil good and good evil. It's a time we're living on now. The Bible talks about there will be scoffers. The Bible talks about many other accounts of people who oppose God, who oppose the Bible. No wonder why um, we live in a country now that become very ungodly, just like back in the book of Genesis chapter 6. Only Noah found grace in the eyes of God. And who bought the ark before the flood? Noah and his household. Only eight of them bought the ark. You know? And I remember, I think, I think for the life of Noah, he would have been, you know, as a young lad, he would have knew about the God of Hebrew, wasn't he? And as he grew up, and God said, so look, that's my guy. I'll command him to build an ark for me. Because the world was filled with violence. Talking about violence, the amount of violence throughout the pandemic is unbelievers as well. You know, if the authorities try to tackle things and so on and so forth, but, you know, there is things still going on around the scene. Abuse and all sorts of things. It's, it's, uh, it's, uh, it's sad to hear, but it's also a worrying time. People have got no form of security in life, not knowing where they're going. People are living in fear. But the love of God cast away fear. And this lady here, she was in a very much similar situation. She was living in fear. No hope, no future, no nothing. And she was willing. She was prepared to do whatever God commanded her to do for Elijah. And he goes on to say that the son uh, has some form of sickness in the very last verse of this uh, book. And the son died. And Elijah raised him back to life. He prayed to God and God raised him back to life. You know, you know, I certainly believe this is actually a time of life. A time of people can be revived. A time of people can be raised back to life, if you like. You know, uh, if you go to uh, the book of uh, Acts, uh, Matthew 24. Matthew 24. Just a couple more scriptures and then uh, we'll finish off. Matthew 24, it talks about the state of the world. This is now Jesus, this is now Jesus speaking, isn't he? Son of the living God. He talks about here in Matthew 24. Um, as a question was actually raised by the apostles, and the apostles got no 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 thought, uh, not knowing what what's uh, what's what's uh, what's the future hold for them and what the uh, you know you know what the outcome of the end of the world. And he goes on to say here in verse 4, Take heed that no man deceive you, for many shall come in my name, shall, uh, saying I am Christ, and shall deceive many. No wonder why we've got so many uh, religion, so many people come in the name of Jesus Christ. And, and you know, some of us here have actually been part of a group, not knowing what actually the truth is. You know, I remember the first ever time I, I got invited into a revival fellowship meeting, I thought, oh, here we go again, this is just some other sort of a, a group. Because I've seen some other group of uh, churches and, and they seems to be sort of not, something is not quite right. You know, we hear like today, like we've got Jehovah's Witness who go knocking on the doors and things like this, all these religious people. But none of them seems to be sort of matches what the Bible has to say. It all doesn't seem to make sense. But the moment I, I came to a meeting and what really got me was the healing. This lady was actually testified that she got healed from God. But she was actually confirming the Catholic Church before she got baptized and spirit filled with us. And that really got me to come and got spirit filled. The moment I received the Holy Spirit 21 years ago, something, I spoke in tongues. Spoke in tongues, never swear anymore, lost the desire of alcohol, cigarettes, nothing. I became as a brand new man. Just we heard like in the testimony. And we have people here as well in our fellowship and likewise worldwide, we have this story this pure story come from God and if something is not man made, it's something that is proven and is evident and it's a living testimony that we can share to others. No wonder why the gospel is still preaching the gospel, people still coming. 
because Jesus has returned yet. Because there are many still needs to be saved. And he talks about here, uh, uh, and, and he shall hear of wars and rumors of wars. Wars have been going on over the years. Uh, yeah, see that be not trouble for all these things must come to pass, but the end is not yet. For nations shall rise against nation. Over the years, we got uh, all the nations fighting over nations, aren't they? I've got a big nuclear weapon, then you, and you do this, I'll do that, and all this other stuff going on across the, uh, um, you know, across the planet, and people uh, pecking, you know, people are in the position to go and move elsewhere, some, some, somewhere that can be peaceful, aren't they? But you won't, you won't run away from anywhere from this world. You got stuck. If you, if you live in a country or another, you know, you know, this world is not, is not safe anymore because of what mankind have actually done. And uh, it talks about in the Bible that God has made man upright, but they've sought out many inventions. So God have actually designed mankind to be right with him and to do it right with him. Adam disobeyed him. That's where the problem comes. And he says, uh, and all these things, the beginning of sorrow, and they shall deliver you up to afflicted and shall kill you and, and said, hated of all nations, my name's sake, and there shall be many offended and shall betray one another and hated one another. But in verse 7, he talks about pestilence. Pestilence is actually a disease. You know, we're having this ongoing uh, bug, isn't it? it? Hasn't actually died out just yet. It's, it's, it's part of the pestilence. No other book is the same as the Bible. You know, the Bible is just unique and, and very clear. And it talks about at the middle of the time that we're living on now. But uh, it, talk, it says here, Jesus said, this is the beginning of sorrow. If you go to Acts chapter 2, Acts chapter 2. Um, pick it up in... Um, this is now Peter preaching after he got converted. He talks about here in Acts chapter 2 in verse 37. He says, Now when they were heard this, they were pricked in their heart and said unto Peter and to the rest of the apostle, Membran, brethren, what shall we do? You know, people have got uh, nothing else to do, isn't it? They've tried all sorts of things. Perhaps they try uh, all different things. They've tried churches or religious leaders, or they try this, and none of them seems to work. And Peter goes on to say, no, you must get baptized. All have sinned and come short in the glory of God, isn't it? So, and then Peter said unto them, repent and be baptized, every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sin, and ye shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. For the promise is unto you and to your children, and to all that are far off, even as many as our Lord our God shall call. In many other words, he testifies, saying, Save yourself from this untoward generation. Save yourself from this troubled world. Save yourself from this confusing world. You know? And he goes on to say, 3,000 people were baptized, and then they gladly uh, uh, received his word, were baptized, and the same day they were added unto them 3,000 souls. That's the beginning of Christianity. The beginning of God's spiritual church. He quite said, you know, he said to actually look into the history of, uh, of this fellowship, they've actually lost through the time of the Roman Empire. The coming of the Catholic Church, the Roman power, they changed everything. The full immersion water baptism used to happen then. That's what baptism actually really means. In Greek, it means baptizo, to be immersed in water. But it's all changed in history. You know, and getting all the babies to get baptized. I was baptized when I was a baby. It was confirmed in the Methodist Church. But the moment the Bible was open to me and I realized, no. So baptism is the way Jesus did. It's quite sad how mankind have actually changed everything. Today, this weekend is called Easter. It's the Easter weekend. You know, it's quite interesting in the New Testament, you only find Easter once in the Bible in Acts chapter 12. But the word Easter is the Passover. It's the Passover of the Jews, that they've actually been doing it since the time that they came out of Egypt, you know, from slavery. That was part of their feasts, and they're still doing it in Israel today. But the moment the early church got baptized in spirit field, that was their Easter. We don't make a big fuss about Easter, uh, you know, Easter. We follow the way Jesus have actually did it, isn't it? It's quite interesting that the way, you know, this is where all the Easter eggs and all these other things have actually came into place. The way, you know, the moon gods, the sun gods, the pagan gods, they all sort of mixed up. 
No wonder why Christmas has become very popular as well. It's all change. Mankind changed that. This is where the problem comes. Religion has changed it. No wonder why people don't want to come to religion because it's, it's just full of confusion. People have got nowhere to go. They're stuck. You know? But this is it, folks. This is the answer. This is a clear answer. Just to finish off in Mark chapter 16. Mark chapter 16. Uh, just to finish off on this one. Um, Mark chapter 16. Okay. This is now Jesus said, He said unto them, Go into the world and preach the gospel to every creature. He that believe and is baptized shall be saved, but he that believeth not shall be damned. And it's quite interesting that the word believe here is the doing word. You know, it means to be act upon it. Um, you know, if you just going back to the book of Deuteronomy and many other accounts in the Old Testament about the difference between the two obedience and, and disobedience, you know. And, 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 the, and the things that they follow about people who disobey God and, and the benefit that they will have, which is not nice. You know, it's just bringing a lot of problems, isn't it? And, um, uh, but uh, Jesus has actually come to give us a breath of life, to give us an abundant life. He wants to see us that we are happy, you know, that we are joying, that we are experiencing healings and miracles. We pray to God and he will answer prayer. God wants to see us that way, through the Holy Spirit. You know, that He's real, that He's our security, He's our shield. And whatever that we're going to do, whatever we call, we have a situation we come through in life, He will look after us. No wonder why Jesus comes to the storm, isn't He? He comes to the storm. You know, even the wind and the sea obey Him. That's how powerful our faith is, Jesus Christ. You know? If He comes to the storm, in every situation in our life, he can do this. He will do the same. We have testimony right here, aren't we? He comes to storm to this uh, to this young girl here, taking away anxiety, because that anxiety and depression it causes a storm. It drags you to a very, very, you know, bad situation. It's not very a nice experience. But someone can take us away from that. It's Jesus Christ. He's the one who will take those things away. He will heal us. And he talks about here in verse 70. And these signs will follow them. They believe. In my name shall cast out devils, they shall speak with new tongues. Speaking in tongues, of course, is a sign of receiving the Holy Spirit back in the book of Acts. The very beginning of Acts chapter 2, when the early church, or the apostle Peter and the rest of them, they receive the power of the Holy Spirit. They receive this wonderful experience, being filled with the Holy Spirit. They spoke in tongues, and their life completely changed. And they shall take up serpents, and if they drink any deadly thing, it shall not hurt them. They shall lay hands on the sick and they shall recover. We have an abundant testimony, aren't we? Like yesterday, we were hearing a testimony from, uh, who's this brother from Sydney? Got healed from, um, what's his name again? He was uh, doing his testimony. He started with D. Anybody remember his name? Ah, uh, no, no, from Australia. He started with D. Him and, and there was two guys, they were talking, and but one of them, Jed, wasn't it right? Okay, I got it wrong. It was D. We started with D. It was Jed, right? Okay. Great testimony, isn't it? Wonderful testimony. You know, of a brother who, uh, who was a, what, a biker, some form of, uh, he's got chains on his hair and he's got, you know, gold, gold uh, some form of silver wearing type of clothing or something. You know, you, you know what the biker look like, aren't they? They're they, um, 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 a hippie or something. But, uh, but anyway, the Lord really miraculously changed his life. You know, somebody who's involved in drug and all those sort of situation. You know, and the moment he received the Holy Spirit, his life completely changed. He got healed from stroke and a couple of other bits and pieces. It's amazing what the Lord uh, can do and will do. So then after the Lord had spoken unto them, he was received up into heaven and sat on the right hand of God. And they went forth and preached everywhere. And the Lord working with them, confirming his word with signs following. What a great, big, wonderful God, folks. We've got such a fellowship, a church. The head of the church is Christ. And obviously God is the director, you know, and we are, you know, we are the servant and we just have this joy, this enthusiasm, this hope within us that it's eternal. It never, you know, it never, it never, it never, you know, it never died out. 
That's why we come and, and to share the wonderful things that the Lord has done in our lives. You have a beautiful testimonies. We have the word of God and it's, and it's preached clearly. You know, this is why we have, if people have any questions, we answer them from, you know, from the word of God. We've got such a wonderful knowledge, you know, of, of what the Lord has, has, has given us, has, has done in our lives. And we know that people, as uh, people who are visiting here today, they will also have the same. You know, if you are willing, God is able. It comes to the desire of your heart. God is the one who knows our heart. And he will replace that heart and give us a new heart, a brand new heart. It's called the Holy Spirit. You know, because once upon a time, our heart was called a stony heart, isn't it? It, 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 it says in the Bible. And, uh, you know, God is the only one who will take away that and give us something even better, a brand new life. If any man be in Christ, is a new creature. And uh, I'll leave it there. And all the people said, okay, we're going to have a time of communion. Um, okay, so um, we might get candy up and um, get Ola to pass around the elements when he's ready. Okay. Maybe we'll sing a five seven five. Caroline in, in the chorus book, please we'll we'll sing that as a hymn. So we just remain seated while we are singing for a hymn. 